Aloha. I'm Tim Apicella, your host for Moving Hawaii Forward. Each Tuesday, our show is dedicated at looking at traffic on Oahu and finding ways to both address it and hopefully solutions to improve it. One option to relieve traffic was a demonstration pro uh, ferry project the Department of Transportation Services set up back in 2008. It was short-lived. However, there were and have been discussions about from a couple of lawmakers that maybe another ferry could be put in service. I'm here with Stan Osserman, also known as Stan the Energy Man, who may have some ideas about ferries or potential involvement of alternative energy for this future concept. So with me today, Stan, thank you very much for coming on the show. Very much appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to uh, some of your ideas about not only ferry service, but also um, alternative energy for other vehicles. So thank you. Good to be here, Tim. Yeah. Nice to finally meet you, and congratulations on your show. Oh, appreciate and, uh, it. It's been looking good so far, so I'm, I'm really impressed. And we definitely need to be talking more about transportation. As you know, Blue Planet keeps giving Hawaii and Oahu a D- minus and D-plus area for transportation. And we're not doing too well in renewable transportation so far. So yeah. and thanks Texas, for the help. And Texas A&M, um, their traffic uh, um, review for the nation puts so Honolulu about number seven. So yeah. we're, we're always either six or seven, and uh, that's not a good place to be when you're yeah. trying to attract tourists. Nope, sure not. Yeah. So Stan, how did you get into the alternate energy uh, business, and how did you all start this? Well, I was actually uh, working with the National Guard. I was uh, an active duty officer, uh, full-time officer, I should say, with the National Guard um, for the last 35 years. Retired in 2014, but during that time, when I was a colonel, um, the governor wanted all the colonels in the guard to facilitate anything that had to do with active duty projects like um, Makua strikers or new flight patterns or whatever it was. Mine happened to be energy. So I was actually selected by the governor to work on energy projects with US PACOM and all the components here. So about 2005, 2006 forward, um, I was doing a lot of energy stuff between the military and the state of Hawaii. And that's how I got into, into energy overall. Uh, when I retired, um, the job at HCAT came open and had been open a while. And they were looking for someone that had my kind of background. So I, I jumped in there to, to run HCAT. Okay. So you are focusing mostly, though, if I'm not mistaken, on hydrogen energy and the application to the state. You, that, I mean, you're on the state task force. You head that up, right? Well, I'm the state hydrogen implementation coordinator. Right. Okay. And that, that was put into law two years ago. And I'm going to be meeting this afternoon with DOT on some, uh, some other initiatives uh, on hydrogen okay. uh, in the transportation sector. Um, but a lot of people think hydrogen is something separate from an electric vehicle. And actually, one of the biggest points I'd like to make today is that hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are electric vehicles. Right. And electrification of the transportation sector is critical for us to meet our, our goals, our, our zero emission goals and our clean energy goals. And the hydrogen piece, starts to feed back into the solving some of the grids problems. So some of the things we could be doing to help transportation, i.e. fuel cell vehicles, could also be helping the, the Hawaiian Electric folks with their grid stabilization and energy storage issues that they're going to have to look at as they absorb more and more renewable energy. Right. And the military is getting involved with alternate energy sources for their, their, their ships and vehicles and everything, yes, if I'm not mistaken. They're very active uh, nationwide. I understand the Navy is actually looking at biofuels. Uh, they've already done it. They've already done it, yeah. It's, Air Force as well. As, as well. Yes. And so you're, you're working with them as far as um, the application of hydrogen. Uh, or, right. We're, or, doing, we're doing two major, we have two major focuses. We've started off in hydrogen with hydrogen vehicles. Mm -hmm. Currently, we also are, are doing a microgrid with the Hawaii Air National Guard out at Hickam where we'll demonstrate the, the wing, a flying wing, a fifth generation top of the line fighter wing can literally come off the grid if it needs to and function entirely off renewable sources for an indefinite period of time. That's, that may sound fairly common sense and straightforward, but it's never been done before. It's never been demonstrated and as you know, uh, what works good on paper doesn't always play out well in reality. Right. But we've had some great engineers uh, working on this, and they're highly confident that it's, it's going to demonstrate something that the, the whole DOD would like to adopt. And for sure, the Air Force has said they want to try and look more seriously at Right. I have a friend who, um, who <coughs> works uh, with Cummins and their diesel engines. And, you know, things have come a long way over the yes, years because biofuels were going to be the savior 
uh, for you know reduction of uh, fuel consumption, and you know when it comes to certain technologies of diesel engines, that just didn't quite come to save the day. But it's getting better and better as, as we progress so through, through through the years. And there's some great folks like Kelly King and the folks uh, doing Pacific Biodiesel that are working on on yeah. it locally. And a lot of it has to do with you know again this is a holistic approach. When you start looking at biodiesel, you have to also look at agriculture because right. you're getting the the feedstock from agriculture. Well, if you're growing crops just for fuel, maybe that's not as good as growing food and using the residual from that food crop, the stalks, the stems, the leaves, to turn into fuel. Right. And it's all got, it's all got energy in it, and most of it's even hydrogen, by yeah. the way. So <laughs> you get on both sides of the street, right? That's right. Okay. Well, I wanted to talk about, you had mentioned some ideas to me um, <laughs> off the show about um, how we could try to look at traffic issues on the east side of being, excuse me, the west side of, say, the Ave Capole area. And I'd be interested to kind of follow up on that with you. Sure. Well, I, I've had a lot of interface with DOT and some, some folks at Pearl Harbor that are, are frustrated when it takes so long to get from West Oahu and even as far as the stadium area in Pearl Harbor, Hickam, uh, for their folks. And they've always looked for ways to, to um, reduce the travel time, the transit time, and reduce the cost even if they can. And we've looked at just all kinds of things. They, they used to have small little shuttle cruisers that went in Pearl Harbor that could take care of some of the folks that worked uh, for the Navy inside mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor at Ford Island or in a Navy base proper. Um, but most of those have kind of stopped either from lack of use or whatever. But with traffic, it's always, it's like supply and demand. The worse the traffic gets, the more people are willing to look at alternatives. Yeah. I think we've almost reached that tipping point where people are just so fed up with sitting in traffic for an hour and a half, you know, on a bad day and, and 45 minutes on a good day maybe, that, that it's worth looking at some alternative uh, answers. And uh, one of the things that, that we have to understand is that not everybody can own a car or should own a car or wants to own a car, um, but public transportation is not a money maker. Right. It's something that, that the state has to commit to and say, hey, we, we understand that we're going to have to pay a bill here, but it's for the, the greater good. Yeah. It's, it's to get people more productive or to make more jobs. I mean, if, if there's more jobs and more production, then there's more tax revenues and it pays for itself. But well, just to hit on that point, Stan, um, DTS, which is the bus, um, they their subsidies are 176 million. Yes. Okay. So even with the best <laughs> transit systems in the country, exactly. the best they're pulling off the fare box is about 19 to 20 cents. Maybe it's a little bit better nowadays, but maybe it's around 20, 21 cents. But that leaves an 80 cent, um, an 80 cent off the dollar deficit yeah. for each and every person that gets on that bus. Exactly. So, like I say, it's not a money maker, and anybody that goes <clears> and <throat> thinking it could be or gets sold that it can be, it's that's a tough that's a tough case. Yeah. Okay, well, let's, um, let's talk a little bit more about your idea about uh, how this might work. Okay. Well, one of the things that I can tell you is that, that transportation is always, uh, in a business sense, it's always a lose. If you can cut transportation logistics costs, you're, you're getting way ahead. And, and most of the folks like Amazon and you know, folks like FedEx and UPS, they get it. They understand that if you can, if you can make things more efficient, they've got it down. So how do you move the most people the fastest well, first of all, you try and shorten the distance, if you can. Um, you try and put the most people on a single vehicle, get an efficient vehicle, try and do that. But we're kind of out of space and out of ideas when it comes to West Oahu. But when you really look at some of the, the, um, the terrain uh, and look at the possibilities, you, know, you mentioned in your intro that we've tried a ferry before from West Oahu to downtown, and that wasn't really successful. Well, did we shorten the distance? No. Did we make it more convenient? Maybe when it was working, but mm -hmm. when it didn't work, you were screwed. Right. And then you had to be out in the big in the ocean. Well, I'm a fisherman. I've designed boats and built boats, and my son and I have fished for over 25 years. And the Hawaiian Ocean is nothing to fool with. You get outside the reef, you're mm -hmm. you're in serious uh, Hawaiian waters yeah. that'll that'll take a, a big boat and make it real uncomfortable at best, yeah. it could even and, be dangerous. And during that demonstration, <clears throat> the, the duration was a full one hour. I right. mean, that's, so that's a lot. save you time? That's, that's enough time to get you green in the gills, so yeah. to speak, yeah. Yeah, if you're prone to seasickness, that's just another yeah. thing added to but the... But did it save time? Okay, I'm going to 
That's a great question, and I want to address that because I had uh, last week two guests on. They were both commuters. One gentleman, I think he woke up at 3.30 in the morning so he can be at work at 7. Um, he had a, a solid two-hour one-way commute into town. Yeah. And the other gentleman, he woke up at 5.30 just so he can get to Pearl. And so um, what was fascinating, though, is I, I asked him the question about what do you do when you're, you're, you're in bumper to bumper? I mean, how do you feel that time? And is it stressful? It has to be stressful. Um, and the gentleman um, that went to Pearl Harbor said the following. He goes, you assume that it's relaxing because, you know, you have the music on, but you're not relaxed. You're in a constant state right. of, of being, trying to be alert so you don't get into a fender bender. So you're never in a state of relaxation. Whereas, to answer your, you know, to address your comment, if you're on a ferry for an hour, you actually can relax. You can right. read the paper. You can take a nap before you go into work. And, so, and that's, that can be said for any kind of public transportation. People on the bus will read, uh, listen, to, listen to books on, on tape. Um, I, I lived in Washington, D.C. for a summer. Uh, people on the metro there are, you know, they can actually sit down and start work. They yeah. can start working. They can work on their laptops. They can they can do a lot of things. Yeah. You can't do it when you got to pay attention to the road. I mean, you if can. you're not paying attention here, you're part of the problem causing accidents that make this trip that can be even slower. That's correct. So, you know, um, duration, comparing duration um, is a valid point, but I think there's a, a state of relaxation that you get to enjoy on one mode exactly. versus your it's being near. a single occupancy vehicle driver. So exactly. um, that's why I think the ferry is still a very viable idea and a good, good concept. And we'll talk a little bit about how the project was set up to begin with and the expectations of what, what was a viable um, success. And I think sometimes um, transit agencies tend to set the bar a little too high. And then after a year's demonstration project, they said, well, we didn't hit our numbers, we weren't even close to the numbers, and therefore um, this demo didn't work, and we're not going to do it again. So we'll talk a little bit about that with the, the ferry project that was back in 2008. But go ahead, I'm sorry, so, I so took my, you off track here. Yeah, so <laughs> for, for what I'm proposing, or what I'd like to propose, is that we look at express buses on a ferry. Not individual cars on a ferry, but express buses. And I don't know if, um, if the producers can throw up any of the, the slides I've got, but if we, if we can put one up there, this is, this is actually one of the, this is the end state. This is the trip across Pearl Harbor as I envision it. And being a military guy, I'm, I'm fairly familiar. In fact, if you look at the right-hand side where that red line ends, that's where my hydrogen station is essentially, so I'm very familiar with that corner. But what I've, what I've done is drawn a line from uh, a formerly used part of Iroquois Point which is basically abandoned, owned by the Navy right now, with a perfectly good landing site for ferry boats that could make a very short commute inside Pearl Harbor across the channel, which is maybe 500 yards. I mm -hmm. mean, it's, it's almost like a bridge makes more sense, except you can't put a bridge there. And if you used express buses, and you put people in express buses, maybe had a big parking lot. One of my other shots actually spans out a little bit. You can actually see where you could park cars on the right-hand side there, where you could actually park some vehicles. I, I, I outlined it, it in black. Is that the in right. black? Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that, that's all Navy uh, slash state land that's uh, not currently occupied by the Pulo Rifle Range or any of the housing at Iroquois Point. It's just old um, weapon storage area that's been abandoned and could be used for like mass parking and shuttle buses. I don't know how many acres it is, but I would imagine it's probably at least 100 to 150 acres. It's a lot of area. That's a lot of area. Um, you could put PV in to cover okay. parking. You could put a, a bus a depot in there. And on the left, if you look farther to the left at, Bar at um, Kalailoa, that's also state land that's turned over from the Navy or in the process of being turned over from the Navy. That could be used uh, also for parking, and the buses could start there. And there's several routes that could get you from there to that, that mm -hmm. um, drop-off point for the ferry to go across that short channel. Right. And again, that does shorten the commute, which is part of the key, and it also keeps it in the calm water of Pearl Harbor Channel. You can schedule it, the, the, you can put a controller there that makes sure that you deconflict ships coming in, and ships do come in and out of Pearl Harbor quite often, but it's not constant, yeah. and you could definitely synchronize the ships. Okay, well, I'm gonna ask a couple questions about that when we come back from our commercial break. So, okay. uh, this is Tim Mappuccella, we'll be right back. Aloha, this is Kelee Akina with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha. 
Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Aloha. I am Reg Baker, and I am the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 in the Think Tech studios in downtown Honolulu. We highlight successful stories about businesses and individuals and learn their secrets to success. I hope you can join us on our next show on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Until then, aloha. Welcome back. I'm Tim Apicello. This is Moving Hawaii Forward. My guest this afternoon is Stan Osserman, and we're talking about the ferry, and we're talking about the viability of, of maybe another ferry could be uh, um, implemented, and we could try to move people from the Eva area or the Iroquois Point to uh, Pearl Harbor area. Stan, thanks. Thanks, Tim. And yeah, where we, where we left off, we were talking express buses, and you could also put some passengers on there, military passengers, that if they had their military ID when they get to the other side mm -hmm. on Hickam and Pearl Harbor, they could show their ID and get off the ferry, but the rest of the folks have to stay on the bus. And then the bus would route itself straight to the freeway, uh, counterflow to the traffic coming in to Pearl Harbor and Hickam. So it would actually be counterflow already. You wouldn't have to do any special coning or anything. It's a fairly short and a straight route mm -hmm. that we already know the buses can, articulated buses can make. So, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I think we have a photo of that harbor, so let's take a look yeah. at that. There you go. That, Yellow line there is it depicts the uh, the actual route on the right hand side of getting to the freeway mm -hmm. through Hickam Air Force Base, and on the left hand side just shows some of the feeders that go into that that area that's abandoned by the Navy right now or not used particularly by the Navy on the south side of uh, their storage areas um, that could be used for parking lots, maybe parking lots with PV on top, um, parking vehicles, charging vehicles. Uh, shuttling buses across on the ferry. Interesting. And so you could have a morning commute that maybe starts at 4.30 or 5 a.m., mm -hmm. starts moving across the harbor, and then stops at 7 or 8 a.m., and then starts up again in the afternoon going the other direction, maybe even opening it up to POVs or private vehicles uh, during the middle of the day instead of just uh, mm -hmm. the current city buses. How many uh, buses can you do you envision that could fit on the ferry? <clears throat> I'm looking at between four and six articulated buses on a single ferry so it would be so 80 big. Well, that's about 80 people if it's a full full bus it's about yeah. 80 folks so if you if you you'd have to really sit down and look at the infrastructure first and then the design of the of mm -hmm. the ships the ferries that you'd put into place maybe see if there's something already built that that would suit the the need and would work and we could get it at a reasonable price and look at the price um, if you have to start a design from scratch that's probably going to be pretty prohibitive yeah but i mean I'd say we have the variety of buses. If an articulated bus won't fit, maybe the 40 regular, footers. regular 40 footers yeah. will work fine. And you just start working with what you can afford and try it out, make sure that it, it runs right and it, it works. And if it does, expand it. If it doesn't, you know, you pr really haven't made a huge investment. Yeah. Though. Well, the, you know, obviously you have a military um, employer that would be very interested in getting their workers <coughs> there Certainly. on time. Mm -hmm. um, that's the Fed side. And the last demonstration project was between the city and, and the feds. They, they split that cost equally. And so maybe there is an opportunity for the feds to say, you know, we're willing to try another demonstration project. Um, I think so. And, the, and I think people underestimate the, the great relationship that the military has with the city and the state here in Hawaii. Um, across the whole, the whole island chain, the military has been great uh, stewards of... Uh, of the land and they've really tried hard and I can tell you the leadership mm -hmm. in the military really tries hard to work well with the state and the folks at the Chamber of Commerce and the state they they really work hard to make the military feel welcome and the military is a huge part of our economy here so uh, it's a win-win-win if we just sit down put our heads together and say hey can we try this and yeah. how do we make it happen well that's that's a good point Stan and that is can we try this but you know I think and I think you pointed out very well that the, the other uh, ferry project, demonstration project, probably didn't work. The ridership didn't happen for a variety of reasons. One could be it was just too rough. I don't know. I never rode it. I wasn't, um, I didn't, uh, I just never rode that particular ferry. And so the, the question is expectations of what's success? How, how do you look at success? And if you do obtain uh, success, how do you fund it for, you know, for years to come? 
But uh, here's an example where expectations are created for a demonstration project, but not necessarily realistic. So back in 2008, before they uh, put that ferry into place, again, it went from um, Barber's Point to Aloha Tower, Pier 9 on Aloha Power, uh, right? Pier 9 in Aloha Tower area. And so they estimated they were going to take 400 cars off the road. Doesn't sound like a lot, but, you know, 400 is better than nothing. And so when I did some digging, though, I mean, each, the boat that was used had a capacity of 150 people. And there was only three trips in the morning. There would be a responding, you know, three Not trips. Three. Yeah, return trips. So if you take 350, 150 times three trips, that's 450 maximum capacity. They were estimating 400. Okay, so that, that tells me that they thought they were going to get ridership uh, well above 80, 90%. And, you know, that doesn't happen. It takes years to grow ridership, right. be it a new route on a bus, right. be it, uh, I, I used to uh, uh, ride a water taxi from West Seattle to downtown Seattle, and mm -hmm. it took years to get the ridership up right. where people could depend on the boat, it was on time, um, and it took, you know, about at least three years yeah. for people to feel comfortable. So the point is a demonstration project maybe is, um, should be more than one year. Right. Uh, to see what, you know, how do you, how do you tweak it left, how do you tweak it right to get the right mix yeah. so that this thing can be successful. Exactly, and, and I think scaling is part of that. You know, it's like the problem we have with hydrogen right now. How do you get <clears> it on the road in transportation? Well, where do you start? It's going to start small, and it's going to have to grow. Some things scale well, some things don't. This kind of project could scale pretty well. If you made one investment in one ferry that could move four 40-foot buses, mm -hmm. which, is, which would be kind of on the low end, you talked about, what, 80 people per bus? On about a an art articulated, oh, an articulated max, bus. Max. Okay, so let's go with um, maybe 50 people on a 40-foot bus, mm -hmm. including people standing up. you got four buses. That's 200 people right there. Right. And on we one start trip. Off, one yeah, trip. On one trip. And right. they're making, from that, that short distance, that's probably a 10-minute drive. And, and that includes docking on both ends. It's, mm -hmm. it's like almost longer to try and dock on either end than the whole trip, it's, uh, than, the, than the transit itself. Yeah. So um, you think the, the shortest um, interval would be about 30 minutes at best? I would, I would think that that would probably be the longest the interval. The longest? Yeah. Well, you know, you're, you're, you, you've done... You know, you 15 sailed. to 20 minutes, yeah. I think. To get across the channel is, is literally five minutes. Okay. It's going to be positioning the ferry into dock it and do it safely right. and maybe having to wait for a, a ship to clear the channel before you can cross. Those kind of delays would, would increase the time. But again, Are those facilities there now? Are they all set and ready well, to go? Well, what's interesting is the, uh, and, and Zuri just put up uh, the images again, on the right-hand side there, um, that whole landing is actually completely unused. It's, it's an old... Um, it's an, an, an old landing for, for ships and, and offloading, um, like, uh, the big cargo ships and things, but totally unused, has a, a fairly large parking lot, I would say 300 feet by 1,000 feet in front of it, which could be used for uh, maneuvering the buses around and, and getting them in and out of there in the afternoon. Uh, to the right of it is a, a wastewater treatment plant, so it's not going anywhere, and it's, it's not a facility that has a lot of uh, vehicles and stuff moving in and out. And to the left is where the Army puts their ships that do transport. So it's, it's th that area is already taken up. But that area where the red line ends on the right is mm -hmm. pretty much unused. The one on the left, um, Special Ops uses it from time to time for training. Um, it was put there originally for unloading and offloading munitions. And all those little pads you see in the green area to the left, they're basically empty concrete pads. So, so it's almost all ready to go, almost. There's going to have to be an investment there, but mm -hmm. it's not eight hundred million dollars or, or you know anything close to what we're spending on some of the other alternatives right. we're looking at. So I think if we scaled it small enough, started it off, like you say, give the ridership a chance, uh, give the give the the um, confidence in the system a chance to prove itself, and have people like go park down there, jump across, get over there, yeah. be in downtown quick. Let me ask you the um, the correlation between start times. At, at the base versus <laughs> where the, um, you know, the, the gridlock actually begins on H1. So what, what are the starting times, do you think? Um, <clears throat> well, Pearl Harbor Shipyard actually starts fairly early. Yeah. Those folks are in 5, 5.30. In fact, um, probably the, the, the um, harbor picture that, that we had up there, I could actually point to the areas. My son works in the shipyard. Mm -hmm. 
they have to park like a half mile away from where they're working. I mean, when you look at the, the shipyard is just on the, uh, the north side of Hickam, so it's about the top 30 year picture. That whole part of Hickam is the, uh, is the shipyard. Right. And if you look for the big parking lots, they're a quarter mile or a half mile away from where the, most of the guys have to work. So if you had a shuttle bus that went on the ferry from West Oahu that was on with the other buses that was just servicing Hickam, and the people showed their, their shipyard ID when they got on the shuttle bus, and it went straight there, those folks wouldn't have to drive in and out of Hickam, and they could probably start uh, their, their typical time and decrease the traffic that starts at 4 and 5 a.m. Uh, from West Oahu. Right. Um, likewise, uh, I've actually been approached by some of the contractors for Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam to do shuttles on Hickam and Fort Island. Really? Again, that use like the, um, the, um, the boats that aren't used by Arizona um, Memorial Tours to shuttle people See, more now that like would the be, old. That would be a fascinating uh, perspective because here's the problem when you get to with um, the Department of Transportation Services. You're, you're basically trying to, you, you call it an express bus, but what, what the transit people call it is a custom bus. And the problem with a custom bus is that it's geared towards a specific targeted employee base. And what they want for recovery, believe it or not, is 100% of operational costs. Now remember I said all your other regular buses are getting at, luck, at best maybe 19, 20 cents on the dollar. But because it's a specialized bus, they want, a, they want 100 cents on the dollar which makes it really, really difficult. Well, that's, um, I, that necessarily isn't realistic. So, I no, mean, it's not. If you just have to make a point to them that for this experiment, try yeah. it. it well, might, and, it might and be here's how we got it. I mean, we ran a, lot of, a number of custom buses to the Boeing Corporation. Uh, they had their main plant up in Everett, Washington. And we would go from South County all the way up to Everett, Washington. And uh, what, what would happen is you look at what the, re the revenue <laughs> was recovered from those who wrote it. But that differential, the Boeing company actually would pay for, would pay for it. Exactly, and yeah. that's how you do this. Uh, the Pentagon works the same way, by mm -hmm. the way. It's a federal agency. But if you work in the Pentagon and you agree to take public transportation, they give you a, a, a um, pass. Yeah, they're going to give you an annual pass, pass yeah. for the whole trip. So if you're looking for that kind of return and the government's willing to say, yeah, we're employers of uh, X number of people out here and it's worth, it's worth our effort to, to help, mm -hmm. that's how those things work. That's the kind of effort you need to make. Yeah. Well, Stan, you know, what I love about this show is I have guests that come on that bring new innovative ideas, things that haven't been really thought about or they've been tried. They, they, you know, here's a new way of trying something new. And rather than just sit in gridlock and just be frustrated, we're bringing solutions to the table. And I can't thank you enough for bringing your solution to this table. And I think it's a, a topic worth of, worthy of discussion in the future. And um, I'll be I'm, glad to come back and I hope talk about how we'll implement it. Someday. Okay, <laughs> good. All right, well, that's our show for this week. I'm Tim Apicella, and this is Hawaii Moving Forward. And come back next Tuesday, and we'll, we'll talk to you again. Thank you.